admit it. You aren't like them. You are not even close. You might occasionally, occasionally dress yourself as one of them, watch the same mindless television shows as they do, maybe even eat the same fast food sometimes. But it seems that the, the more you try to fit in, the more you feel like an outsider. Watching the normal people as they go about their automatic existences and lives, for every time you say club passwords like have a nice day or weather is helpful today, right? You, you yearn inside to say forbidden things like tell me more, tell me something that makes you cry or what do you think the job is for? Face it. You even want to talk to that girl in the elevator. But what if that girl in the elevator and the balding man that walks past your cubicle are thinking the same thing as you? Who knows what you might learn from taking a chance of go on going on a conversation with an strange? Everyone, everyone carries a piece of the puzzle. Nobody comes into your life by mere coincidence. Trust your instinct. Don't expect it. Find the others. And as Seth Godin said, connect the disconnected. Welcome to the Disrupt Everything podcast series. I'm Isra Garcia, your host, the host. And today I have a very special guest. And I'm going to start with a quote. Event plus reaction equals outcome. Many people do not distinguish between something that happens to them and their reaction to it. Yet, isn't it? It is not the event or the situation that holds the emotional church. It's our beliefs that create our response. Today, we have the author of this quote, a disruptor, and as I call it, a modern sage, a modern elder. Not by his age, by his experience. Today we have uh, Chip Conley. Chip, welcome to the Disrupt Everything podcast series. It's great to be with you, Ezra. Thank you. We are blessed. So tune in and we go deep into an interview and a conversation with Chip Conley. Who is Chip Conley? Chip is an unstoppable entrepreneur and game changer. He is New York Times bestseller author and the founder of the world first midlife wisdom school, the Modern Elder Academy in Baja California, in Baja California Sur, Mexico, where students learn to repurpose a lifetime of experience. He also is the founder of Fest 300, part of the Everfest and San Francisco's Celebrity Pool Toss and Hotel Hero Awards. One of the books uh, Chip has written, well, the books he has written as The Rebel Rules, Daring to Be Yourself in Business, 2001, Marketing That Matters, 10, 10 Principles to Profit Your Business and Change the World, 2016, and then 2009, 2006, sorry, and 2009, is a go with the 24th edition, Peak, How Great Companies Get Their Mojo from Maslow, 2007. Emotional Equations, uh, 2012. Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder, 2018. And The Land of Yet, a Colony Book for Modern Elders, 2020. Chip is rebel hospitality and, and, uh, entrepreneur and said New York, uh, New York Times bestselling author. Chip has disrupted his favorite industry twice. At the, at, the, at the age of 26, he founded Jo. I never say this name good, man. Joe de Riff. Joe de Riff. <laughs> Hospitality, transforming a, a inner city model into the second largest boutique hotel brand in America. He sold GDV after running as a CEO for 25 years. And soon, the young Founders of Airbnb asked him to transform the promising startup into the world's leading hospitality brand. Chip served as a Airbnb heads of global hospitality and strategy for four years and today acts as the company's strategic advisor for hospitality and leadership. 
his, his books made him a leading authority in the intersection of psychology and business. And Chip has, a, has been awarded a, by the most innovative CEO by the San Francisco Business Times. Um, and he's the recipient of the Hospitality Highest Honor, the Pioneer Award. And he holds a, a, bachelor, a bachelor and an MBA at Stanford University. Chip main focus right now are in his Modern Elder Academy and also sabbatical sessions he offers uh, with the Modern Elder Academy online offering, which is just getting started. Uh, Chip and I were going to meet uh, in person in Baja California in Modern Elder Academy in March. They ha had I had the flight, I, everything was ready, uh, but we didn't count on a global pandemic or a global virus. And uh, we, we just thought that this time would be better to do it online and maybe wait for a round two that I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna visit Modern Elders Academy. And Chip, thank you. And uh, it's an honor to have you and honor also the friend that made the in that intro, Tucho. Great to have, great and thrilled to have you, Chip. Mm. Thank you. It's uh, my honor. Um, I wish I could do all of this in Espanol. Uh, <laughs> estoy mejorando. It, it's getting better. Uh, eh, pero mi español es muy malo. Um, <laughs> so let's uh, tell me, I hope all of your questions are in English. Actually, I am better at understanding you saying it in Spanish than I am in saying it back in English, but um, let's do it all in English. And I'm looking wow. forward. Wow, okay, okay, okay. We'll do the second, the round two, as I hope you can visit us in Barcelona, Ibiza, and you'll have time to, to improve the, the, the Spanish and I'll have time to improve the English too. <laughs> so, uh, after this amazing career, like um, rich career, rich experiences, if you were about to put your your life in a timeline, which is a timeline of our lives, and highlight the most important milestones and what happened there and what did you learn there that was so transformative or important, what which milestone milestones would you share with us? How many do you want? <laughs> One, three. Four, five, as, okay. as you feel comfortable. I'll, I'll, I'll give you three. Um, Perfect. <clears throat> I think the milestone of starting my company at age 26, uh, joie de vivre means joy of life in French. Um, it was the mid 1980s in the United States. I was in San Francisco. And it was very clear that the uh, phenomena of boutique hotels were starting to spread in the United States, but it was very, very early. Um, my background was in commercial real estate, so I understood uh, how to develop like uh, office buildings and things like that. But I had zero experience in hotels. And, and yet I was so um, fascinated and my intuition told me that boutique hotels was gonna be a big trend. So I, I quit my job at age 25, started my company at age 26 and um, bought a broken down motel in a bad part of San Francisco and called it the Phoenix, uh, like the mythological bird rising from the ashes. And um, that's how I got started. So I would say the lesson there, what's the milestone? The milestone was everybody told me I was wrong. <laughs> My father was willing to make a small investment and help, and help raise some money, but everybody told me I was wrong. This was a mistake. And um, my gut, my instinct, and my intuition told me I was right. And so trust, trust my instincts. I think that that's probably a, a very, very good piece of advice. Um, uh, and I've used that over and over again. Uh, let's fast forward to the milestone at age 47 of dying. I died and I went to the other side. There is actually a festival in Spain, in the northwestern part of Spain called the, the pilgrimage of the near-death experience. And if anybody who has ever had a near-death experience, maybe gone to the other side and come back, comes together and has a weird fest festival. 
Spain is the number one place in the world for weird festivals. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can just say that. Um, so I had a near-death experience. I, I went to the other side. I had a broken ankle, a septic leg, and I was on an antibiotic and I was allergic to it. And so I ended up dying a few times and I was shocked back to life by the, the bomberos. Uh, uh, so the paramedics. <laughs> so, um, and this was in, in St. Louis, uh, Missouri in the United States. And um, the milestone there was, my gosh, I knew that it was time for me to no longer be the CEO of this company I'd founded. I, at that point had been running it for 22 years and I knew it was time for it to end, but I had no idea how to end it, especially at the start of a great recession. And so I had to have the courage to be willing to let go of something that has basically represented my identity in adulthood, um, being the founder and CEO of what at that point was the second largest boutique hotel company in the United States. But I knew it was the right thing to do because I knew that I no longer had a passion for it. And so I did sell. I sold at the bottom of the market. Uh, Joie de Vivre, my company, is now part of Hyatt. So I did okay, but not very well financially. It was not a huge financial benefit to me. But um, I did keep hold of some of the real estate that I owned, which was good for me in the long term. And then it opened me up to have the space to try something new. And that was my third milestone would be joining Airbnb. And this was eight years ago. Um, when Airbnb was a small tech startup and a lot of people didn't know wh who the company was. And the three founders approached me because they had no experience in travel or hospitality and, uh, and or strategy or frankly, entrepreneurship. Or, you know, there's a long list of things they didn't know because they were young and they had stumbled on this great idea and, um, and done, a, done a phenomenally good job of, of growing the company. But now it was becoming a big company. Um, there were about 200 employees at the point that I joined. And um, the milestone there was, again, everybody told me I was an idiot to join this little tech company that was going to actually fail, which of course it hasn't failed. But more importantly, the milestone was this. The milestone was how do you shift your identity based upon changing times? <clears throat> so what was very clear is that I had been the founder and CEO of my own company. It was my identity. I was what you would call the sage on the stage, meaning I was the face of the company. And when I joined Airbnb, I was no longer the sage on the stage, but I was the guide on the side. I was the person helping guide them. I wasn't getting a lot of attention. My ego was not getting, you know, ballooned up and, you know, it was more like, you know what? I want to do this because I want to help be the mentor to these three, three young, young founders. And Brian Chesky, I was literally day to day, his mentor, um, uh, but I was also reporting to him. He was 21 years younger than me. And I reported to a guy who was also my mentee, which is an unusual situation. Um, so the milestone or lesson there was um, adapt, be willing to adapt. Uh, I had to learn what it meant to join a, a tech company for the very first time. I'd never worked in a tech company and I was 52 years old. And the average uh, age in the company was 26. So that willingness to adapt both what I was learning, but also my identity and how I saw myself um, allowed me to be very effective there. And I've now been at Airbnb in, in a variety of roles for four years full-time, 70 hours a week, and for the last four years as a, just a strategic advisor. Thank you for, for these three, three big and important milestones. What, what life... What uh, life-changing lessons did you did you learn from these twenty-four four years running GDV? So um, I learned. So on a personal level, I think I learned that you have to disconnect your sense of self-esteem from the company's success or failure. There are many many reasons a company will succeed or fail. Some of them, most of them, not, well, I don't want to say most, some of them completely unrelated to what your efforts are. And I remember when someone first asked me in the first year after the Phoenix, my first hotel had opened, so Chip, how are you doing? And my immediate response was, the Phoenix is doing great. 
And, and then the person said to me, Chip, I asked you how you are doing, not how is your hotel doing? And I think I got a real wake up call there as a hotelier <laughs> that, that, ah, my identity and my self-esteem of who I am can be disconnected from the success or failure of my businesses. So I think that was a good lesson. Um, another lesson was surround yourself with people you both trust, who are really good at what they do, and you enjoy being with them. Because life is too short to surround yourself with people who might be a subject matter expert, but you really just don't enjoy their company. Um, uh, culture. How do, you, how do you create a culture that actually grows and is a magnet for great people? Um, that We were famous for that. I, I've written books about that. Um, and I think last, maybe the last uh, lesson I would just say is uh, I learned from Richard Branson from Virgin and Richard was, uh, wrote the foreword for my first book, The Rebel Rules. And he says, Chip, when I'm creating a new business, um, my mantra in my head is I am the market. I am the market, I am the market. And what he would say is create products that completely delight you as a customer that, you're, hmm. that you fall in love with. And, and otherwise it's not worth the time or energy. And I think I, I, I've taken that to heart because I have rarely wanted to get involved with creating a business that wasn't something that I as a customer was not passionate about. So I wanna, I wanna create businesses that, that I would be passionate about as a customer. It's really powerful. This, uh, the last one is like, um, it has to be with the, uh, it's, it's easier to find to create products for your customers than find customers for your products, right? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's really much more important to have a hundred customers who are passionate evangelists who love what you're doing and will tell everybody than to have 10,000 customers who like what you're doing but are not passionate about it. Because those hundred customers ultimately over time represent an enormous amount of marketing, but also lots of long-term value because they'll come back and they'll be loyal no matter what. Um, now, if you're gonna be a huge company that's gonna be all over the world, you have to do both, ideally. Create passionate evangelists and a huge number of them. And that's hard, but I will say that Airbnb has done a pretty good job of that. Um, and I'm proud in my eight years of being there that that was part of my job. Part of my job is to figure out how to scale Airbnb to a much larger audience than what it was when we first joined. Last, thing, last interview uh, was Kevin Kelly, who, who has a concept which is called 1,000 True Fans. It's an essay which talks yeah. about yeah, the, the heart of what you say is just, you know, the light, the people that, fan that is already within your, within your influence, right? A cheap yeah. measuring what life or measuring what makes life worthwhile. What has changed 10 years after? Because now it makes 10 years that after you did this talk, it's 10 years. What has changed? I'm, <laughs> I'm if, now if 60 years old. Something. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm now 60 years old, not 50 years old. That's one change. Well, you're, you're speaking about my TED talk uh, and I've given exactly. two TED talks. I've given a lot of TEDx talks, but just two TED talks. And one of them was 10 years ago. And then one of them was two years ago. The TED talk 10 years ago um, spoke to the idea that uh, what's most valuable in life is often the things that are intangible and hard to measure. Happiness being one of them. I went to study the Gross National Happiness Index in Bhutan because they were the first people to actually create one. Um, uh, in terms of what's changed, I, I would say here's the good news. On a, on a macro level, what's changed is I think the world sees more and more that, um, that happiness is exceptionally important. And there's now 50, 50 countries in the world that, world that have their own version of a gross happiness index. So uh, I hope that my TED talk helped to escalate interest in that subject. Um, I, think, I think in the last 10 years, companies have come to realize that not all the value that they have are, is on their balance sheet. That things like goodwill, which shows up on a balance sheet, but it's usually a technical accounting term, uh, or loyalty, employee loyalty, customer loyalty, or brand reputation. That doesn't show up on a, on a balance sheet. 
um, that these things that actually are intangible are exceptionally important. They are what create a long-term sustainable competitive advantage uh, often. Um, so I think that's more clear. Um, and I think on a personal level, I have made personal choices along the way that have led me to being more focused on my own life satisfaction than my net worth fin financially. And so that would be another example on a personal level, you know, uh, that I have made choices and I've turned down many, many things that could have made me a lot of money because I didn't want to, I didn't want to uh, address, I didn't want to deal with the collateral costs associated with, with making that decision. Um, Henry David Thoreau, the famous philosopher and writer said, the cost of something is measured by how much life you have to give for it. So what are you in essence Amen. saying? The cost of something is measured by, if you have to give your whole life to something and there, you have no room for anything else in your life, then that's a huge cost. And a lot of times we don't measure that cost based upon how much of our life it is taking up. Now that you are, that you are holding a, a position in Airbnb after, after eight years working now as an advisor of strategy and leadership, what are, what are your, your takeaways? And also what do you think is your contribution or legacy in the company? And what do you get in return? Well, I feel an enormous satisfaction that Brian Chesky, who I've been working with for eight years, is still the CEO. He was the CEO when I joined. He's still the CEO. You can't say that about the CEO of Uber or WeWork or a bunch of other companies. So I have a lot of pride. I think of him almost like my son. And I have a lot of pride <laughs> that my son, my son has accomplished a lot. And he's a better leader as a result of it. And I think that because I was there, the company has a better culture as a result of that. Although culture was something that was important to them even before I arrived. I would say that the company's understanding of the importance of hospitality and, and the travel industry is much greater because of my involvement. Um, so I think you know what I would say for that is that um, Brian sometimes quotes me as saying, hospitality is when you do something for someone as opposed to to someone. He says that all the time. I'm no longer there day to day, but when someone does something for you, you feel it. It feels good. And when someone does something to you, it feels like you're upset. And and how do we how do we address our host community, the Airbnb host community, in that way? And and I would say also emotional intelligence. Brian can see the importance of emotional intelligence in his leaders. This was not something he focused on when I joined necessarily. And another concept was the idea of mindset. How do you shift from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset? So one of the things that Brian really, really appreciated when I joined and I said, this is, we want to create a culture based upon a growth mindset, which means that we're not trying to prove ourselves. We're trying to improve ourselves and we are willing to try things and make mistakes for the sake of learning because we get better as a result. So I, you know, I think probably the number one thing though, is the first thing I said, if, if I've helped to create a, an effective CEO, who can deal with in this pandemic, Airbnb going from being in serious trouble as a company just in March to now going public in December with a very strong value, making it, you know, along with Marriott, the, maybe one of the two most valuable uh, hospitality companies in the world. I, I do believe that I've had a legacy there. You were talking about uh, emotional intelligence and also business. And um, I've, I've read uh, and, uh, about you, that you are, that you mix or you believe that the, the core of the intersection between business and psychology, what is in there for us? <laughs> well, I, someone once said, to, said when I was going on stage, they introduced me that way. They said, this is the crossing guard, which means the person who's helping young kids walk across the street on their way to school at busy intersections for, so the cars can see a stop sign. Um, Chip is the crossing guard at the, at the busy intersection of psychology and business. Well, 
typically psychology and business aren't thought of together because one of the most neglected facts of business is that we're all human. And we forget that fact because it doesn't show up on a balance sheet. Um, but I think what I've helped a lot of people see is that leaders in the company, the higher you are in leadership, the more of the more contagious your emotions. <clears throat> so you are the emotional thermostat of those you lead. You're not the thermometer. The thermometer, the thermometer is something you take the thermometer, it tells you the temperature. No, a, a leader is a thermostat. They set the climate in the room. And so if you know that, and if you know there are qualities you want your company to have or your team to have, you better embody those qualities yourself. And so it's pretty simple stuff, but it's not easy to do. And um, so I think that I have been, you know, having written a bunch of books at this point on this subject, I think people understand that this is um, a more important thing. EQ, emotional intelligence, is more important for leadership than people uh, have historically seen. And this is, I'm sure, it has something to, to, to be linked with the uh, Burning Man. Uh, so it's, I guess, and I know, I know pretty well that you are a, a burner and really at the heart of uh, of what it means to be a burner. So. So what influence has caused you or has made on you being in Burning Man or going, attending Burning Man in life and work? So the first year, so I've been going to Burning Man for more than 20 years. And um, I was a founding board member of the nonprofit that, that supports Burning Man. Burning um, Man Project, right? Mm -hmm. The Burning Man Project, exactly. Thank you for saying that. Um, the first time Brian Chesky ever went to Burning Man was in 2013, soon after, not, not long after I joined uh, Airbnb. And he said something that I think was just so right on. He said, um, Burning Man is what the world would be like if artists ruled the world. So I think that one of the things that I get from Burning Man is the, the, the value of art, creativity, curiosity, and being liminal has in our lives. To be liminal means you're in between two places. You're sort of, it's often an awkward place, but it's actually a free to, freeing place because it's, a, it's in the process of transformation. So for example, when a caterpillar turns into a butterfly, in the middle is the cocoon, the chrysalis. And it's in that cocoon or chrysalis that all of the magic happens um, and this gooey, dark place is where the caterpillar turns into a butterfly. So Burning Man can be that way. And I think Burning Man can be a place where people are transforming and, it, and to understand that it's okay <clears throat> to sometimes feel awkward in that, in that state of transformation. Um, it's also a place where r radical and re rebellious thinking and artistry is, is at the heart of it. Uh, you know, Burning Man's had an enormous effect on Silicon Valley in our technology world. Um, it, is, it is a place where many, many famous technology people from Elon Musk to the founders of Google uh, have, have gone multiple times. Um, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time with the, the founder of Cirque du Soleil, um, Guy Laliberte. Yeah. Um, and, and Guy, you know, Guy, Guy got a lot of his ideas from going to Burning Man. I mean, he, he started his, he started Cirque du Soleil way before uh, he went to his first Burning Man. But Burning Man yeah. was, was uh -huh. a place that actually really spoke to him. Wow. Yeah, but this, um, so you were saying that, that you were near to death many, some, many times, or at least one time, uh, if I recall well. So, did, um, did you feel that was like an awakening? And if so, do you have contemplative or awakening practices that you carry on with you, I don't know, since then or mm -hmm. before then? So I, um, it was an awakening in the sense that it was, I, I died nine times in 90 minutes and, um, and I kept dying. Uh, and then they kept shocking me back to life or my heart would come back on its own. Wow. And so, I mean, I think that what I, what I experienced was the sense that, wow, at any moment in your life, you can die. 
So I have a sense of urgency of the things I want to do in life. Um, I was not very patient beforehand, but I think I became even less patient, um, especially for the things that were really meaningful to me. Um, I, I, I would say that beyond that, I, um, I take time every week. So a, a practice that came out of this is I try to take time every week spying on the divine. What does that mean, to spy on the divine? To spy on the divine means you go out looking for things that remind you of the much bigger world beyond you. Now, I live in a spectacularly beautiful area in the southern, the southern Baja Peninsula. I see in, in your Instagram. I see in your Instagram. Yeah. So I'm in a beautiful place. And I so because of that, that allows me to spy on the divine very easily because there's just so much beautiful nature nearby. Um, but you could do that even closer to home. And, and the divine doesn't have to be nature. It could be humans. It could be your animal, your, your pet that is, is, is divine in its own way. So I think being able to go out and do an awe walk, A-W-E, a walk uh, that where you're actually feeling a sense of awe, this is a, this is a practice that I do um, because I find that when I feel awe, I feel more alive and I feel smaller in a very good way. Um, most of us need to get smaller in life, not bigger. And what I, what I mean by that um, is that we need to actually see our part in something much bigger. Um, you know, uh, part of our process of going from being a younger person to an older person is the process of moving from the, the operating system of your life being the ego to the operating system being your soul. And that process is one that we don't really document very well as a culture. And yet, um, if you can shift into being in a place where your soul is helping to define how you make decisions and how you show up every day, you're going to find yourself in a much happier place, much easier to get along with, um, and much more, able, much more able to see your part in a, bigger, in a bigger story. So you're not, the world doesn't just revolve around you. And... Um, so that, those are some of the things I've learned along the way. And I like to meditate, that, that helps. I, I, I exercise a lot, that helps. Um, so all of these practices work together. Uh, you, you made me think about uh, something that Dogen, the one of the founders of Zen, or like more contemporary Zen say is study yourself, to know yourself, to forget yourself. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Thank you, Chip, for, for this uh, spark of inspiration. Um, what's, what's the, what wisdom and reinvention, because you, you hold the experience of your life and also you hold the experience of disrupting businesses. So what wisdom and reinvention have in common? Wisdom and revenge? And reinvention. Oh, reinvention. Sorry. <laughs> reinvention. Yeah, yeah. Re <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Reinvention. Um, so I, I think that, so my definition of wisdom speaks to the idea that um, is the pat it's learning the pattern recognition of something such that you can um, forecast the future more effectively because of recognizing patterns in yourself, in the world, in other people, etc. And the more you actually able to recognize those patterns, you're able to see the future better than other people. You have more intuition, you have more forecasting, you're a better futurist, you're visionary. So I think that what that means is your ability, if you have wisdom, is you're able to imagine the future and see it faster than other people. So does that mean that you can reinvent yourself and repurpose things? Absolutely. My ability to sometimes do things against all odds when the world was telling me, stop, don't do that, was very much a function of my confidence from my intuition. And so uh, I do think that you, if you have wisdom, you're probably going to be more willing to reinvent and repurpose yourself be, because there's always going to be forces that are saying, just stay the same, be like you have, like you've always been. 
Because frankly, the moment you change who you are, there are others who feel like, oh shoot, I have to now change who I am. And they don't want, they don't want to do that. So the wisdom is what gives you that internal confidence and intuition that you're on the right path. Chip, um, what can you tell, or, or can you tell us what did you learn writing Wisdom at Work and the Land of Yet? So the Wisdom at Work was a way for me to make sense of um, all of my experience at Airbnb. And it helped me to see that they called me a modern elder. So Wisdom at Work, the subtitle is The Making of a Modern Elder. And what I came to realize is that being a modern elder is someone who's as curious as they are wise. Um, and they feel a sense of relevance in the world because they actually are able to imagine how to take their wisdom and put it in new environments uh, that, are, that they're curious about. Um, and so that book helped me to create the Modern Elder Academy, also known as MEA, uh, here in Baja. Now, the land of yet is a parable. It's, it's like a story, a story, a fairy tales, a story in which I tell the story in a comic book or a coloring book format for adults of how when you find the right place, the place where your epiphanies are waiting to be um, born, you have to trust your intuition and you have to be open to trying things that you have not done yet. And that's why it's the land of yet. The land of yet speaks to the idea that this is a place where you can go and try something. Whereas if you, if you spend your whole life saying, I haven't done that yet, but you never go to the land of yet, then you never actually experience the thing you say, I haven't done it yet. But if you go to the land of yet, you're willing to try things that you haven't, you haven't experienced before, which is part of a, a, the, an underwriting foundation of what it means to have a growth mindset. So, so does this mean that the, the right place you are saying or you were, yeah, you were referring is just here, but we only don't try new things so we don't see it. So here's, the, here's the, the reality of many people's lives is that they have what's called a fixed mindset instead of a growth mindset. When you have a fixed mindset, you are focused on proving yourself. And you tend to focus on, as you say, success is defined by winning. Now that sounds very familiar for people who say, Chip, of course, that's how I live my life. I want to go prove myself. And I only feel like I'm successful when I win at something. Well, here's the problem with that premise as you get older. As you get older, if you believe that you only want to play games that you can win, your life gets smaller and smaller because you're not willing to try things that are new that you are not going to be good at at first. And so what happens is you get bored with life. You wonder why your life feels small. You feel stuck. And so the process of moving from a fixed mindset of proving yourself, you move to a growth mindset, which is about improving yourself. So not proving, but improving and not focused just on winning, but success is defined by learning. And so if you can move from a thinking of your life as being, if you're successful, you're, you're being flawless or perfect, you know, and you instead to move like, oh, no, success is defined by me learning, you're moving in the right direction. Chip, anxiety equals uncertainty per, per power, powerlessness. Joy Times equals yeah. love less fear. And curiosity equals to wonder plus awe. Can you explain these formulas? Because I just truly love them, you know, and I think okay, these well, are really powerful formulas. Okay, so let me try to try to remember each. So anxiety, anxiety equals uncertainty times powerlessness. So this comes from each of these comes from my book, Emotional Equations, 
um, where I went out and studied uh, emotions with the experts in the world. And it turns out when it comes to anxiety, there are almost only two ingredients for anxiety. It's usually feeling uncertain and then feeling powerless. And, if, and together, it's not a plus sign, it's a time sign, which means that it's combustible. It really gets very large quickly. So what that suggests is that what you, when you're in an anxious time, you need to focus on the things that you do feel some sense of that you know, or things that you are certain about, um, and not just focus on what you don't know. And what it says is also you need to find things that you can influence or control when you feel powerless. So um, I, I'll feel free to ask more questions, but that that's that equation. Then there's joy equals love minus fear. And this is a really, this is not a new idea. The premise here is think about a pie chart. If you know what a pie chart is like on a computer, you have two pieces to the pie. There's either love or there's fear. And these are the two, it's like, a, it's like, it's like the ultimate wrestling match. Um, love and fear at war with each other. And love crowds out fear and fear crowds out love. And the result of this is the following, is it's not about happiness. Uh, there's a happiness equation in the book too, which I learned from Bhutan. But it's about joy is something that's much more internal, um, whereas happiness is often external. And joy comes from a place of feeling that sense of love and that sense of love in what you're doing, love in who you are, love in who you're surrounded by. And yet joy is actually often extinguished when fear becomes the blanket that, that turns the light of joy and the light of love into something that is defined by fear. And so, um, so I, I think that joy equals love minus fear is a reminder that when you want more joy in your life, look at how you're creating love in your life. So in any, anyway, and it's, we're not talking about just romantic love. That's not the only thing we're talking about. Universal love. And then, th that's right. And then thirdly, um, uh, curiosity equals... Wonder plus uh, awe. Wonder plus awe. So wonder and awe are very similar, but they're often at different times in your life. When you see a little child watching a butterfly just flutter around or a, a little colibri, a little hummingbird, you know, flying around, you see them in a state of wonder. In fact, Walt Disney, when he create, created Disneyland and his TV series, he called it the wonderful world of Disney. And it was about wonder. And it was like childlike wonder. So when you have childlike wonder, you ask a lot of questions. You're curious. And curiosity is, is sort of a, a basic foundational part of a young child's life. And yet, then we move into our teen years and our early adulthood, and we're not supposed to ask lots of questions. We're supposed to have all the answers. And somehow we get trained to be less curious and more efficient. Because if someone who's curious asks lots of questions, but a smart person has all the answers. So, What's interesting later in life is how this new emotion or quality of being of awe, A-W-E, comes to life. And awe is sort of like wonder, but it's wonder with some experience. And it's seeing with awe the beauty of the world and your small place in it. And, um, and this is part of the reason I do those awe walks. And so oh, both <laughs> wonder, both wonder and, and awe help feed curiosity. And curiosity is the elixir that creates creativity and innovation. The, the business world is very fixated on creativity and innovation. But the thing that is the source of creativity and innovation is curiosity. And I wish that we were gave more value to curiosity. Chip, you were kind enough to invite me for interviewing you at the Modern Endless Academy. 
I'm thrilled by this concept on how important it is not to forget that today we don't need experts. We need wise men or wise women. My first question here is, can you elaborate on the story of what made you create such a necessity such a necessary movement and can you share with us a bit of the journey you've been embarked for the last two years if I recall well and what you have learned along the way yeah so <clears throat> the idea of the modern elder academy which is also known as MEA um, came came to me when I was writing my book wisdom at work the making of a modern elder which I was writing down here in Mexico and I asked myself the question why do we have no schools or tools or rites of passage or rituals for people in midlife. <clears throat> I used to define midlife as 45 to 65. I now define it as 35 to 75 and years old. And so I was curious why we didn't have a place for people to reimagine themselves. And um, so three years ago, we created our first workshop here and um, we opened and the first six months we tested a bunch of things out and then we opened to the public a few months later and we now have about 800 uh, alumni from 24 countries. And I think what we've learned is the following is that people are constantly desiring to repurpose themselves but they don't know how. There's a sense uh, that they're gonna live longer but somehow power is moving younger in a digital society. And so there's a lot of people in midlife, 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, who feel a little bit lost about how to actually take some of the mastery they've learned and maybe apply it somewhere else, maybe in a different industry, a different company, maybe even a fully different career. So we need to help them with that. In a world that's changing faster, people need to be able to repurpose themselves. People also need a sense of community. I think one of the best lessons we've learned is how thirsty we are for community and this is pre-covid uh people people it's not that mm. we don't have friends or family or people in our lives but what we really thirst for is depth of those connections and so one of the key things that mea is all about is how do we help people live a life that is as deep and meaningful as it is long um, and then thirdly is wellness so purpose and community and wellness wellness is a word that we are familiar with, but often we think of wellness and wellness is important. You know, if you're gonna live long, a long life, you better live a healthy life. But the way we tend to think of wellness is very much on the personal level. If I were to ask you or anybody else, tell me what wellness means and how does someone go about creating a life of wellness? You will likely describe a collection of personal activities that define wellness. I need to go work out every day. I need to eat well. Um, I need to sleep well. Well, all three of those things are potentially things you do by yourself. So the word illness in English starts with the, the letter I. The word wellness starts with the two letters we. I versus we. Illness versus wellness. And I say this not to make it sound like, oh, Doing anything by yourself will make you sick. Of course it won't. Um, pursuing wellness for your own health is a good thing. But one of the things we have undervalued in modern society is the we part of it, which I think Spain has been quite, most Latin cultures are quite good at this. The importance of community, the importance of what we do to create wellness with, for each other, how we create that safety net of health um, I call this emotional insurance. How do you have insurance by having people who care about you, often family and friends, who are there for you when things are, are bad? <clears throat> so I think those are some of the qualities, purpose, community, and wellness of what people are looking for. Um, we're getting uh, towards the end of the interview and uh, last questions. Can you share like quickly between three or like your 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 biggest small hacks that makes your life easier? Meditating every morning, very important. Uh, I, there's, a, there's a quote from Viktor Frankl in the, in the, in the um, book, Man's Search for Meaning, <clears throat> which he says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is your power to choose your response. And in your response lies your growth and your freedom. 
meditating helps me be more responsible and less reactive. Okay, what else? Secondly, um, finding time for myself alone. I need that. Um, maybe it's partly because I, I am an extrovert on the outside. That's how people see me, but I have a lot of introversion. And I need, we all need to understand what refuels our batteries. You know, what are the things that refuels our batteries? Because, you know, our batteries are going to die if, if we don't refuel them. So understanding what it is, for me, it's being near water and it's, it's spending time by myself. It's writing. It's we're going for a run on the beach. Um, so I'd say that is important. Another hack. Um, another hack I would just say is um, finding the things in your life that you would do if you were paid nothing for them because you actually are making a difference in the world or because you so feel so passionately about what it is you're doing. Um, in the Japanese culture, there's something called ikigai and there's four pieces to it. And there's a, there's a, in the middle of it, it's, it's basically, what do you love doing? What do you do well? What does the world need and what can you get paid at? And right in the middle of that ikigai um, diagram is, is the center point. And if you can find things that are the center point, um, you are, you're going to be a happy person and someone who's going to make a big difference in the world. So those are some of my hacks. Uh, what, what success means to you after a uh, half lived uh, like a uh, eclectic, uh, after such an eclectic and fulfilling life? Freedom. It's that simple. What can you tell us about your most crazy every five years per day? <laughs> I didn't have it this year, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it, I've had it at Burning Man. I've had it in Marrakesh, uh, Morocco. I've had it in, in Bali. Um, uh, what I can say is I love bringing people together. I have been called a social alchemist. And that means I know how to mix people together in a way that makes for a really strong and good drink. Um, and uh, yeah, I, every five years, I like to introduce my friends to a place or uh, and a collection of people that they wouldn't have met otherwise. And uh, so finally, Chip, what a modern elder like you would say uh, to everyone listening to this podcast on how to navigate in today's world and what piece, what piece of non-requested non advice would you give to anyone listening or watching this podcast or video? I think the advice I would give is um, the meaning of your life is to find your gift and the purpose of your life is to give it away. So the most important thing is to figure out what is your gift? What's the reason you were put here on earth? What's the talent? What's the thing that you can actually build as a talent? Um, it doesn't have to be even in your career. Um, but what's that thing that you actually can, can, can develop And then how do you give that away to other people? Um, that's what I've been trying to do. I'm gonna finish and end up with a final quote. Uh, it's about Chip. He says, wisdom is about being able to see the patterns in things faster than when you are younger because you've seen a lot of patterns and you've seen the implication or results of certain things. I think wisdom can be correlated with age But this is not necessarily correlated. So just because you are older doesn't mean you are an elder. Chip, thank you for your wisdom and where people can find you. So uh, they can look at my website, chipconley.com, uh, where they can find out about the blog. I have a daily blog uh, called yes. Wisdom Well that's on the Modern Elder Academy website. And very popular and you can subscribe, already subscribe for free and I then we send you an email every day um uh and also on LinkedIn I that's probably the social media that I use the most is is LinkedIn um because I, I put a lot of my articles up there and uh Chip last uh, extra question is who would you recommend me to interview next <laughs> uh Barack Obama 
<laughs> well, someone said Michelle, so I have the couple. Both, both, both. Yes. Uh, which I, let me think about that, Israel. I, I will get back to you on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Chip, uh, I'm so thank sorry you that for be, yeah. being in Disrupt Everything podcast series. And uh, see you in round two. And we will send you the interview. Thanks to Tucho. Thanks to you. Big love, respect, and build you. And wisdom. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Look, for, look forward to seeing you in person. Look forward to seeing you in person. For Bye. sure. Bye-bye. Bye. This is Chip Conley, a modern elder, a modern sage. This is Disrupt Everything podcast series. And you've been disrupted because you have been disrupted. We hope you can find us or leave a review in your favorite platform. Find ways to, to, to find people to support this podcast by sharing to others, by recommending it, by recommending who to interview next, leaving a comment in the, in the, in the blog, in israelgarcia.com or israelgarcia.es. And you can download the episode and have it and listen in your favorite media player. Thank you for being here and thank you for being disrupted because you've been disrupted. <laughs>